I'm Judy Trotter. I'm head of adult education and learning at JW3, and I will be guiding us through the event. In other times, of course, we would have been on the stage in our Howard Hall in the JW3 building in Swiss Cottage. And we're making our plans for events to happen um, very shortly. The building will be reopened and people will be back. Uh, on this Thursday, we even have an immersive theatre experience called Isolated. Since March 2020, when the building had to close for the pandemic, we've held the adult education programme online very successfully and we've built up a, a community which has been a joy and uh, opened up new opportunities, uh, including, of course, an access to a worldwide audience and presenters. We're still making new discoveries and tonight, at the suggestion of the Polish Embassy in Vilnius, we're going to simul use simultaneous translation for the first time into Lithuanian. It's therefore important that you choose your language. Uh, the majority of you obviously will be on English uh, so that you can hear everything that is being said. And if you do want Lithuanian, then choose the Lithuanian. We hope this works as a bit of an experiment for us. Um, we're going to keep you muted throughout. And um, we're very happy, or Jack and uh, the director of the Piletti Institute are going to be very happy to take questions at the end of the presentations. Those will just be in the Q&A. So please write them all the way through the event. As you think of a question, put it in the questions and answer box, which you have on your screen. Um, it's now my great honor to introduce His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Republic of Poland to the Court of St. James. Thank you, Ambassador, so much for joining us this evening. And, um, and, and agreeing to open the event for us. Your Excellency, Arkady Jarkowski, over to you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, good evening, Labas uh, Vakaras, Dobry Wieczór. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen, dear friends, thank you very much for joining us for a special event marking a truly remarkable figure and one of the greatest heroes of the Second World War. Today, we mark the 120th anniversary of the birth and the 73rd anniversary of the death of Witold Pilecki by remembering his selfless and courageous acts aimed at helping those prosecuted by cruel Nazi German machinery of extermination. His humanity and efforts to bring justice in the most unjust of times opened the eyes of the world to the horrors of the Holocaust. His story deserves our recognition. Today, we honor one of the greatest truth tellers, perhaps in the world's history, a Polish cavalry officer, Polish Soviet war veteran, and resistance leader. In September 1914, Witold left his wife and two children behind and allowed himself to be captured by the Gestapo. The Polish underground leadership needed someone on the ground in Auschwitz to investigate the persecution taking place there. Guided by his patriotic spirit and the sheer will to help others, Witold knew that he was the man for the job. What followed was a series of remarkable actions by him, which we will have the chance to explore today. Thanks to Witold's sacrifice, uh, and the distribution of his information by the London-based Polish government in exile, the word new. Dear friends, it is with great pleasure that I welcome Jack Fairweather, journalist, writer, and author of the 2019 best-selling and award-winning biography of Witold Pilecki. It is also my privilege to welcome Dr. Wojciech Kozłowski, director of Poland's Pilecki Institute, which for the last four years has been bringing to the world the story of Poles who aided those prosecuted by totalitarian regimes. Jack and Wojciech will then engage in what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. 
I would like to thank you all very much for joining us. Thank JW3 and the Pilecki Institute wholeheartedly for co-organizing the events together with our embassy and thank our speaker for their contribution. I wish everyone a very interesting evening and encourage all to join in the discussion. So now I have a pleasure to invite Jack to the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, let me just share my screen with you for the presentation. Wonderful. Um, well, this is a, a very moving evening for us all to gather together because it is, in fact, the anniversary of Vitor Paletsky's execution. Um, this also happens to be the year marking the 120th year since his birth. And I think it's with that idea of a life about to be lived, of extraordinary deeds ahead, that I'd like to begin my talk with you this evening. And I'd like to have you all begin with picturing a scene with me, 6 a.m. on September the 19th, 1940, and a Polish underground operative, Witold Polecki, sits in an apartment in the Zoliborsz district of Warsaw. This is a wartime image of that apartment. And here is Witold um, in his plaid jacket sitting. He's 38 years old, reserve officer in the Polish cavalry, a farmer, a devout Catholic, and a father of two. Here are his two children, pre-war image, Andre and Zofia. And this is his wife, Maria, um, who was a school teacher in the local town where, um, where he was a small landowner. And here that they are both uh, Vitold and Maria on their wedding day in, in 1931. Before the war, Poland was one of the most pluralistic societies in Europe. A tenth of the population is Jewish, the largest such community in Europe. Then the Germans invaded. Here we see German troops parading through Warsaw under the eye of Adolf Hitler in October 1939. Hitler hadn't formulated his plans to annihilate Europe's Jews at this stage. Instead, he was intent on the destruction of Poland by eliminating its professional classes. Poland was subject to a brutal reign of terror. Thousands of Poles, doctors, teachers, writers, lawyers, Jews and Catholics alike are being dragged from the streets to be shot or interned. 50,000 Polish nationals are murdered in the first four months of the occupation. We just saw images from uh, October 1939 of a typical roundup in Bydgoszcz. The following year, in May 1940, the Germans opened a new concentration camp to hold some of the prisoners. Its name was Auschwitz. Here we see a pre-war map of Poland, the town where Witold and Maria had lived before the war. Krupa is in the top right-hand corner. And Auschwitz is located outside the Polish town of Oswinchim in southern Poland, where the second arrow points. Little is known about what's happening inside the camp. And Paletsky's learned from informants that a roundup is scheduled for Zoliborsz that morning and that those arrested will be sent to the camp. That's why he's waiting in the apartment. His mission is to infiltrate the camp, forge a resistance cell and gather evidence of Nazi crimes. So let's go back to the apartment. Now imagine now the sound of trucks rumbling to a stop outside. Shouts and gunshots follow. The building caretaker bangs on the door. Paletsky's sister-in-law, whose place it is, answers. It's a German roundup, says the caretaker. Get out while you still can. They hear the sound of Germans now entering the building. 
What does Paletsky do? He calmly puts on his jacket and then notices his three-year-old nephew sitting up wide-eyed in bed. The boy's teddy lies on the floor. As the door bursts open, Paletsky picks up the toy and hands it to his nephew. See you soon, he whispers to the child. Then against every instinct he must have had, he steps into captivity. Three days later, he arrives in Auschwitz. Here's an image from 1945 taken by Soviet troops upon the liberation of the camp. You see there its famous sign above the door, Arbach Mac Fry, work sets you free. And here is Poletsky now as a prisoner. Over the next two and a half years, Paletsky forged an underground army in Auschwitz that sabotaged facilities, assassinated SS officers, and plotted an armed uprising. He arrived in Auschwitz at its beginning as a concentration camp for Polish nationals. Thus he witnessed the steps by which the Nazis conceived of and built their death factory for Europe's Jews. He was the first to report to the world on the camp's horrors through his smuggled reports. He was the first to try and stop them. Three years before Allied commanders publicly acknowledged the camp's existence, Paletsky was already urging them through his reports to bomb the camp. And yet, for all of his exploits in Auschwitz, his story has almost been unknown outside Poland. Indeed, I only heard of it by chance. 10 years ago, I met up with a reporter friend of mine, Matt McAllister, we covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan together. We're trying to make sense of what we'd witnessed. This is a, a suicide car bombing that I was caught in in uh, Mosul, Iraq in 2006. I was in the tank to the right there. Um, and fortunately for me, the door of the tank had closed just enough. So when the car drove into it and detonated, the force of the explosion uh, was sent away from those inside although a, a big ambush followed, there I am in my flat jacket with uh, the US forces fighting off the, uh, the insurgent attackers. Matt had traveled to Auschwitz and learned about a resistance cell in the camp. The idea that anyone could resist the Nazis in a place like Auschwitz was a shock to me. I thought of the camp as the ultimate symbol of suffering and victimhood. Paleski seemed to offer a startling new way to see the camp, not through the eyes of a victim, but through those of a protagonist. I also felt personally challenged by the story. When I began my research, I was the same age that Vitor had been at the start of World War II. I also had a wife, two kids and a home. What would make Paleski risk everything on such a mission? And what was it about his act of volunteering that spoke so powerfully to me? I knew I had to find out more, but then I discovered that remarkable fact that so little had been written about him in English. I managed to glean a little bit online that Paletsky had gone on to fight against the communist takeover of Poland at the end of World War II. He'd been captured and executed by the communist regime and all trace of his wartime record was either destroyed or locked away in the military archives. Even mentioning his name in Poland could lead to arrest. It wasn't until 2012 that one of Paletsky's reports written at the end of the war was finally translated. Uh, that report had sat in this rather nondescript building, which some of you will know is the Polish Underground Study Trust in Ealing, a really remarkable place that has contained for so many decades the reports of the Polish underground. And here is a copy of Paletsky's report, his main report about the camp. You can see his looping blue handwriting around the edge of the document. And this is where the report sat for all those years uh, since the war in that beige folder um, perpendicular to the uh, second shelf from the top. What Paletsky wrote in this report though only deepened the mystery for me because the report was filled with gaps. Names were hidden to protect colleagues, events obscured or, or omitted. And the report also left unanswered the crucial questions. What happened to the intelligence 
but Pilecki and his men risked their lives to smuggle out of Auschwitz. Why were his calls for action unheeded? And how many lives might have been saved had the world listened? Five years ago, I set out to answer these questions. I flew to Warsaw in January 2016 on a reporting trip. The first person I wanted to see was Pilecki's son, Andrzej. I was a little nervous ahead of the meeting. After all, who was I, some Brit, to suddenly alight upon his dad's story? Andrzej had been little more than a child when Pilecki was executed. Here we have a image of him and his sister again in fancy dress. For 50 years, Andre had been told that his father was an enemy of the state. He only started to learn details of his father's mission in the 1990s when the communist archives were opened. Of course, I shouldn't have worried about meeting Andre because he was the most kindest and compassionate man I could hope to meet. Here he is in his apartment um, offering me uh, tea and cake on one of our first meetings. He did warn me though, I'm not sure what you'll be able to find out about my dad or where you should start looking. So I told him, Andre, I'm starting with you. So when so little is known about you, the man, I knew that anything that Andre could tell me would be important. I couldn't recreate Paletsky's thoughts beyond what he had written and what people like Andre could tell me about his thinking. What I found amazing when I began my research was just how many people were still alive who had known Vitold. Some had never shared their memories before, either because they dared not to, or simply because no one had asked them. Men like Bodan Velasic, 89 years old when we met, and Jerzy Shakchevsky. Both of these men had fought alongside Paletsky in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944, yet they had not spoken of their experiences fighting alongside Paletsky. In addition to gathering living testimony, I also wanted to follow in the footsteps of Paletsky as much as possible. A large parts of Warsaw had been destroyed in the uprising, but some of the key sites existed, none more important to me than the apartment where Paletsky was arrested. It was the next place I went to after meeting Andre. Here it is in 2016 when I visited. Of course, I wanted to get inside to try and see the apartment with my own eyes. So we managed to get up the stairs to number seven, which was on the third floor where Paletsky had stayed. Um, we, me and my researcher knocked on the door, but there was no one there. So rather disappointed, uh, we were about to leave when my researcher Marta said, well, as we're here, why don't we just record some audio of what it must have sounded like when the Germans came marching up the steps. So she marched up the steps and then gave a good old Gestapo rap on the door, which was what it turned out was needed to, uh, to, to uh, wake up the uh, residents inside, a group of rather sleepy students who had no idea that the apartment where they were staying in was one of the historic sites in uh, Paletsky's life. Or, or this lad indeed, that his bedroom was the very room in which Paletsky had sat waiting in 1940 to be arrested by the Germans. To describe such scenes, I felt like I needed to see them with my own eyes, but even better was when I could combine locations with witnesses of him in action. So you may remember that three-year-old nephew to whom Paletsky handed his teddy bear. Here is the boy sitting on Paletsky's lap in 1939. Turned out that that boy was still alive in 2016 in his early 80s, Marek Ostrovsky, Vitor's nephew. I took him back to the apartment and it was the first time he'd been there in over 70 years. As his family had been kicked out by the communists after the war. So here is Marek confirming that that was indeed the original door in 1940. Here he is explaining to us the layout of the furniture. Bringing Marek back to the apartment made him remember the moment with the teddy bear that for me spoke so eloquently of Paletsky's ability in times of stress to reach out beyond himself. 
Then Marek recalled the moment that Pilecki was arrested. One was in the army suit, German, and another civil. Yes. And they ask mother if there are any men. Mm -hmm. There's any men. Mm -hmm. In this same moment, uncle moved from, from mm -hmm. this room, ask what, what's going on? What's going on? And he was ready to go, he had his jacket on? Or... I think he was prepared because mm -hmm. he has time to, to... Yes. Yeah. Did it, what did he say to you when he was leaving? Did he say anything? Do you remember? He like, See you soon. You... See you. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see Marek was beginning to tear up a little bit there. And by the time we finished visiting the apartment, he was in tears, thinking about Paletsky and what he had meant to his family. To write the book in the vivid and compelling way I wanted to, I knew I was going to need hundreds, if not thousands of such details like that teddy bear. It was only upon my visit upon the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum that I realized where I'd find them. Since the museum's inception in 1946, its archive has collected over 3,500 prisoner testimonies by camp survivors, hundreds of which either touched on Paletsky's work or described events that he had witnessed. Most of them had never been translated or published before. This is one of my favorite rooms in the museum. It's um, in the research departments where I would meet with the research staff to. Uh, to uh, ask them really uh, incredibly complicated questions about exactly um, what type of ovens were in, were in use in 1940 or what sort of food the prisoners ate. And in, the, uh, in that room is this wardrobe with, uh, with most of the prisoner testimonies, volumes of them containing some of the most extraordinary, harrowing, moving accounts of life in the camp. I'd like to go back now to the moment that Pilecki arrived in Auschwitz. It's the evening of September the 21st, 1940. A light drizzle is falling. The train screeches to a halt. The men in the cattle truck with Pilecki get to their feet. They hear shouts and dogs barking, doors being slammed open, and then it's their turn. They're blinded by spotlights, dragged from the train, beaten, punched, kicked, and forced through those gates. Pletsky brought into a building to be stripped, shaved, and issued prisoner stripes, and given a camp number in place of his name. Pletsky's report from 1945 describes his arrival vividly, but I wanted more details. The museum held some extraordinary images that I'd like to share with you this evening. This is a, a painting drawn by a prisoner who arrived around the same time as Paletsky. He survived the camp and was able to give us this impression of what it was like to arrive in Auschwitz. Where you see um, prisoners being shaved, um, others being sprayed down with water that was either too hot or too cold. Um, Jewish prisoners among the Polish nationals who arrived were set upon with a special fury, although of course the Holocaust had yet to begin at this stage. This is a very rare photograph showing the early camp in January, 1941 and Pletsky's block, um, his first barracks is that building in the background. And to the left is the roll call square where upon his arrival in the camp, he and the other prisoners were gathered for their first dawn roll call. And again, we have no images, photographs of that, but we do have a painting by one of Paletsky's recruits that he made after the war that captures some of the, the horror. This is an evening roll call. Um, and we know that because that was the moment when those who had died during the day from being beaten, from starvation, from disease, were brought to be counted one final time before their bodies were dragged to the crematorium just beside the main gate. And this is another very rare photograph showing the crematorium 
um, ovens, the first to be built in Auschwitz a few weeks by, uh, before Pilecki's arrival. And already in September 1940, the SS were writing um, among themselves that they thought that the burning capacity of these two ovens, which was, uh, would not be enough and they needed to build more. I also turned not just to images, but to some of those testimonies of men like Konstanty Piekarski, who wrote about the extraordinary moment when Pilecki started recruiting within a week or so of arriving in Auschwitz. We know, uh, Con knew about that recruiting process because he was one of those first recruits and this is what he remembered. It was an evening, a week or so into his and Pilecki's time in the camp. Prisoners were allowed to gather outside their barracks to socialize, socialize before camp curfew. This is the area of the camp where they would meet called Birken Alley for the birch trees that grow along the edge. They were all starving on less than a thousand calories a day, exhausted from the hard labor around the camp, covered in welts and bruises from the beating. Here's another piece of camp artwork that shows the scene, the prisoners talking nervously among themselves, bartering for food. In the background, one of the German functionaries who administered the camp giving a beating to a prisoner. Pilecki takes Con to one side and reveals to him the existence of the underground, which at that stage is pretty much just Pilecki. And Con's response makes me smile because of its honesty. He says, are you nuts? How can we possibly resist the Germans in a place like this? Look at us. But then Con realized something. He realized that Pilecki, by revealing his mission for the underground to Auschwitz, had entrusted Kahn with his life because Kahn could just shot Pilecki to the Germans if he wanted to for a loaf of bread or a, a safe job indoors. But he didn't because Kahn realized that what Pilecki was offering was something more important than food. He was offering trust and the hope that something greater than themselves could endure in the camp. Of course, Pilecki realized that hope wasn't enough in itself, and he knew they needed to start fighting back. Pilecki initially wanted to stage a breakout from the camp, but he realized it would be impossible given their condition without help from the outside. So he needed to start gathering intelligence to persuade the allies to intervene. The challenge he faced was how on earth do you get a message from there to the allies? Pilecki thought about escape, but that was incredibly dangerous. And any attempt led to harsh reprisals against the rest of the camp. But then about a month into his time in Auschwitz, Pilecki learned that one of the prisoners was going to be released because his family had paid the right bribes in Warsaw. Through an intermediary, Pilecki approaches the man and persuades him to carry a report to Warsaw Pilecki couldn't write anything down, that would be far too dangerous. So instead he had the man memorize his words and swear on his life to pass them all on to the leadership in Warsaw. What were those words whispered by Pilecki one evening in the roll call under the noses of the guards? No one had succeeded in tracking them down and all that Pilecki gives us is the name of the man who was his messenger, Alexander Wielopolski. Here's a, a pre-war image of Alexander. So I'm with that name, my researcher, Louisa, managed to track down Alexander's son, an elegant gentleman in his eighties named Piotr. Here is Piotr when we met him in 2017 in Warsaw. Piotr had no idea that his dad was one of Pilecki's messengers, or indeed not just any messenger, but, but the very first to bear witness to the horrors of Auschwitz. Crucially though, Piotr was able to guess at whom his father had stayed with in Warsaw, a man called Stanisław Dembinski. So a few months later, my researcher Marta called me one evening outside the Polish Underground Study Trust in Ealing. 
I could hear the emotion in her voice. I found it, she told me. I found Paletsky's report. That name Dembinsky had allowed her to sift through the thousands of underground reports and missives stored in the Underground Study Trust to find the one folder of documents that charted the progress of Paletsky's report across occupied Europe to the Polish government in exile in London. I write about this remarkable journey in the book, but I wanted to share with you this evening the shocking message itself. This is what Paletsky had to say, and I think it captures both his desperation and his clear sightedness. We beg the Polish government for the love of God to bomb the camp and end our torment. Should we die in the attack, it would be a relief given the conditions. This is the urgent and well-considered request sent on behalf of comrades by the witness of their torment. Already in 1940, Paletsky recognized that what was happening in the camp was so terrible, it was worth his life and everyone else's if it meant destroying Auschwitz. I was able to dig up then what happened to Paletsky's report in London, the fact that it was handed to the head of the Royal Air Force, Charles Portal. I found then Portal's extensive correspondence with his commanders discussing whether or not it was possible to bomb Auschwitz. I'd like to pause there for a moment, just to consider that remarkable achievement. Paletsky's words, composed in the direst conditions imaginable, now being discussed at the highest levels of the British government. Paletsky didn't just do this once. By my count, he sent at least 10 reports via secret messengers from the camp that charted Auschwitz's evolution to a death factory. He described the start of the program to euthanize sick prisoners, then the early gas experiments against Soviet POWs, then of course, the Holocaust itself. All of his reports made it to London and each of them called on the allies to take action. That's why his work in the camp is so historically important. He was revealing to the world just how the Nazis could conceive of murder on an industrial scale. And yet, for all of his exploits in the camp, I keep coming back to that moment of volunteering in Warsaw. And here's why. Because in that act of volunteering, Paletsky set himself on a trajectory that was different to every other prison person sent to the camp. Paletsky was in Auschwitz by choice. He chose to go to the camp. He chose to form an underground cell. He chose to smuggle reports out of the camp. Why is that act of choosing important? Because he reminds us that empathizing with the suffering of those beyond our immediate family and friends is also a choice. As the fate of his report shows, it's not the instinctive response of many people to seek to come to the rescue of others especially if they themselves are in danger or facing hardship. But just because it isn't our instinctive reaction, that doesn't absolve us from taking action. The Nazis were counting on the world turning away from their crimes. The survivor, Simon Wiesenthal, recounts being told by an SS guard upon arrival in one camp, however this war may end, we have won the war against you. None of you will be left to bear witness, but even if someone were to survive, the world would not believe him. Paletsky asks us, no matter how gruesome the subject, no matter how difficult our own circumstances, that we never stop trying to understand the plight of others. Paletsky was incredibly to escape Auschwitz himself in a final desperate attempt to inform the allies about what was happening in the camp and to plead with them to take action. He was then caught up in the Warsaw uprising that devastated the underground and um, ultimately led to Poland's occupation by Soviet forces. Pleski, after the war was to go on to fight against the communist takeover of Poland that led to him being captured 
and placed on a show trial, executed, and all trace of his extraordinary work in Auschwitz being deleted. In fact, when Paletsky died, he believed that on some level he had failed to deliver his message, failed to persuade the Allies to take action. My hope is that through my book, um, I can show that it wasn't Paletsky that failed. He succeeded in alerting the world. The failure to take action lies elsewhere. For the past five years, I felt compelled to follow in Paletsky's footsteps. As a reporter, I've always been drawn to extremes, and I found none greater than Paletsky's story of survival in Auschwitz. It describes the worst we can do to each other, and surprisingly, some of the best. The volunteer came out in 2019, and it's in the process of being translated into 25 languages. It forms a, the basis of a major international exhibition by the Plesky Institute in Berlin. And I'm also pleased to say that I was able to track down a Jewish family that Paletsky saved um, after escaping the camp and arriving in Warsaw. And I'm in the process of applying with Yad Vashem for Paletsky to be recognized as one of the righteous among the nations. I've come to believe that Paletsky is one of the greatest heroes of the Second World War. And if you read the book or read his report, I know you will be inspired like I have been. But please help me in sharing Paletsky's remarkable story and join me in following his footsteps. Thank you so much. My goodness, thank you so much, Jack. What an extraordinary story and what an extraordinary way you have of uh, sharing it with us. Um, I know there will be many comments and questions coming in from the audience uh, when they've recovered from hearing all that. Um, and again, I'll take this opportunity to say, oh, you can't sit very clearly, but that the book is also amazing to read and very easy to find. It's uh, in Amazon bookshops um, by the publisher. Um, but now it's my huge honor to introduce you to um, the, sorry, let me just do that to the director of the Piletsky Institute, <coughs> director Wojciech Kos Koswalski, um, who is going to build on, the, on Jack's presentation. And he'll talk about the significance of the story of Wisnowald Piletsky and how his story has, has brought to the public. And um, we're really so happy you could join us this evening, director. And um, Thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's, it's a true pleasure to be here today with you, and especially uh, to contribute to this meeting right after the wonderful presentation by Jack Fairweather. So thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for remembering about me um, in all your um, endeavors concerning the the recent history and the totalitarian regimes and the Polish confrontation with it. And well, thank you, Jack, for taking Witold Pilecki's story to the world. We have been doing this for quite a time together. And I have to confess that this is not the first time I have heard this presentation. And yet, every single time, there is something I find for myself there again. And again, so that's a really great thing. And um, it was, if I still may share a little bit of my personal um, experience with, uh, with Vito Pilecki's story, I remember um, still early in 2019 um, having Jack over in my office together with Hanna Radzijowska, the head of our Berlin branch in, um, and actually setting first steps towards creating this exhibition that Jack mentioned. And I remember asking him, okay, what do you think is the, the first thing, the very first thing that we have to take from Vitold Pilecki's legacy? And he said, trust. He said, trust, and I said, excuse me? I said, like, I, I like courage, right? Bravery, great soldiers. No, he said, trust. 
and trust me, I will explain this to you. And that's what he did. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. But that was that was an amazing ex uh, well experience of uh, of unraveling the uh, what Vitold Pilecki or who Vitold Pilecki was and what sort of legacy is in his life and uh, how we can build on that today. Um, so let me just start with stating the obvious today, this very day, this is the day of memory about Vitold Pilecki. He was executed 73 years ago and I was today laying flowers very close to the place where he was most probably killed at the prison at Rakovietska Street in, in Warsaw. So he was executed after a short trial and he was condemned to oblivion. Obviously, he is still now with us and this oblivion that the communists wanted to, uh, uh, well, to put him into it uh, is, is then work. But still, there are two questions that perhaps I can, I can sort of work with today with you uh, that I think are pretty important and they can refer from one place to another to what, um, to what Jack Fairweather said. Why Pilecki? And why today? Why we do care about Vito Pilecki? Why do we speak about it? Why do we have in Pilecki Institute in the first place? Why do we talk about him? And why now? Why in 2021? And of course, part of that answer has been given already by Jack because in many cases, Vito Pilecki is simply a figure that you cannot remain indifferent when you learn about his story. It's often quite a personal meeting, a personal encounter with somebody that is intriguing to say the least and overwhelming with his, uh, with his persona to say more. So he is fairly well known in Poland these days and that's the outright uh, denial to what the communists wanted him to be. We don't know where he is buried first, just to remember that. We don't know where his body is. We, look, we have been looking for it for years. It's still not 100% sure if we, if we can find. There are some ideas, hypotheses, but we didn't pin it down yet. So there is no body, but still there he is. There is his family and there is a good number of people in Poland and beyond Poland who believe that his story should continue. So he is a powerful and I would say shining symbol of the dark moments of the 20th century Polish history. And also a member of this great generation that dared to confront and resist two totalitarian regimes, Nazism and communism. Sort of one of those who, as Jack said, risked everything to stand up to political evil. And this is not so far away from what we have to uh, deal and handle these days in our everyday life. And I'll come back to that because when we think about his legacy, the story, his story we learned from Jack, and now I'm sharing with you my take on his legacy because it goes together with the way we're trying to memorialize him, how we want to bring him as an institute, as a research institute devoted to the 20th century totalitarianisms and it's their history, uh, how we want to bring him to, uh, to the world and show him as a universal figure. So his legacy perhaps starts with, with freedom, with this powerful notion that motivates so many of us to, to act. And Jack nicely put it at the very end of his presentation because he opened it with the question, why did he volunteer? Now, it was his choice. And the choice, the, the ability, our ability to make choices is actually, a, well, a clear sign of our freedom. 
So he was free to choose and he was free to choose for the sake of the others. And that's what he did. And he did it under German occupation in the land that was oppressed, where people were slaughtered, where people were uh, persecuted. And yet, and yet he managed to maintain his internal freedom. And that's a powerful legacy to my understanding. We are so happy sometimes to, to give up and say like, well, the, uh, the power of, of faith or, or the faith around us or whatever is just pushing us into one direction or the other. And Filetsky says, wait a second, this is a moment of your choice. You can stop it. You can turn the tide. You can go either with the tide or you can go against it. And that takes courage, another piece of his legacy. Courage that comes from this, I would think, from this belief that you are a free person and a free person can decide about myself and I know what is right and what is wrong and I want to go that way and I will not back down. Then comes trust. Trust in people. Trusting people means, and especially in the Auschwitz camp, trusting people means entrusting them with your life. The only thing that you can actually try to preserve in that conditions, and yet you cannot survive without entrusting your life to the others because they do it the other way. And they only in the community, only together, only in teams, in groups, secretly or less secretly, you can survive. You won't survive in the camp alone. This goes with hope. Trust goes with hope. And then if we ask why he volunteered, he believed that that was right. And this was the way of fighting the occupying power. So... One of the elements or segments, a huge segments of his legacy is love for his homeland. But not in a chauvinistic way. It's more like responsibility for something that is common, that is ours. Something that we built, and he was 17 when Poland regained um, uh, his, uh, well, its independence in 1918. And he built that country together with so many millions of Poles and other nationalities. He defended it in 1920 as a young soldier against the Bolshevik invasion. And he took responsibility for his family, but also for something that was greater than him, that his family, that was his community, that was his homeland. And this goes together and that we can see very easily in his reports. That's the value of human life. The value that means we, we simply cannot accept with what was going on in the camp, all this killing people, all this torturing people. The world has to know and it has to know not only for political reasons, not really for military reasons. This is actually one of the explanations why the Allies did not react, because Auschwitz was not an important military target, but for moral reasons, for reasons that this sort of hell on earth just cannot, cannot exist, and we have to obliterate it. And what Jack also mentioned, he was devout Catholic. So he, his part of the part of his legacy is also based on his strong morals that are rooted in his firm faith in God. And I believe this actually extends human perspective. I mean, this faith in God that he had extends human perspective beyond this earthly, beyond this earthly life and refers to certain levels of moral order, order that man cannot violate without hurting himself and those around him. Which means there is a system of rules 
that that Vito Pilecki was closely tied to, and he believed that he is a part of the bigger story, and he is supposed to stick to certain principles because they are simply right, and they are about the human life, about freedom, about courage, about um, trust, all that I mentioned. Things that in a very practical way, we, when we hear them, we, we, we tend to notice like, yes, this is, this is the thing that, but I believe it's beautiful. Something that makes us so, so human in contrast to what made, make, makes us inhumane and, and appalling. So when we come to the question, why Pilecki today? Why we talk about him? Why do we bring him back to, to our understanding, to our knowledge, to our memory? Why, we do, why do we discuss him? To me, frankly speaking, the answer is very, very easy. We just need him. We need Vitor Pilecki. And not really as a statue melted of bronze, not as a person we put up on a pedestal and we bow down or lay flowers or wreaths of flowers and burn lights on his day of birth or on the day of his death, but more as something that, again, Jack already said, as an inspiration. We just cannot turn away from his story. We just cannot turn away from him. Because he tells us something about ourselves. And if we want to look into his story to, to understand better ourselves and where we go, what we can do with our lives, what sort of choices we can make, this is when this inspiration comes in. Because he helps us to understand how to live together in a today's society, how to respond to its pains and challenges with a sense of duty, not with a sense of indifference and that this is not my part of my story, but with a sense of responsibility. This is the common good that I have to contribute in the way that I can. He didn't stop the Germans. He didn't stop the Holocaust, but he did his part. And we remember him and that's what made Jack Furweather inspired by him as well. And I make this claim because I heard it from you, Jack. I'm not telling. <laughs> so he helps us to face setbacks with courageous heart and remain loyal to our principles. How to keep other people. That's perhaps one of the most fascinating parts that I always try to bring in whenever I talk about Vitor Pilecki outside his story, but more about the meaning and his significance. It's how to keep other people and the greater good as one of our principles. Something that we want to stick to, something we want to remember, and we want to live the life according to that principle. Some people tell me that perhaps he can inspire to how to, how to love others as well. So, Vitor Pilecki was condemned to death and oblivion. But as an enemy of state, but we cannot bring him back to life, but we can resurrect his memory. And that's what we're doing. And here comes my closing statement here about, because I still want to leave some time for, uh, for, for the discussion. Um, here comes the part, how to tell Pilecki, how to tell Vitor Pilecki these days, how to bring him to our contemporary world and how to uh, try to uh, go beyond his heroic story here in Poland and try to inspire others beyond uh, the, the borders of, of my country. So there are two ways. And one is, I would call it conventional, meaning telling his story, covering his story. And a wonderful example of that is Jack's book. And I believe after his presentation, you'd have no doubts about that. There are also other scholarly books. You can keep telling his story and putting him into different contexts. 
we as an institute we have uh, we have opened uh, the exhibition in Berlin telling the story of Vitor Pilecki as a volunteer to Auschwitz but again build up with a greater context of the German occupation that started in 1939 September so that to explain how it what sort of uh, political social and everyday life uh, circumstances Vitor Pilecki made his choice and volunteered to enter the camp and then we go through it up to the point when he is executed by the communists and he is supposed to fade away and disappear into into the past without us noticing him that's that's a very interesting and successful exhibition i must tell um the germans the german audience uh is very happy to when they have a moment because these days uh it's still it has been closed for a while because of the pandemic but yeah it was pretty successful people were coming in schools were coming in and also i think um you have good number of international tourists interested in in the topic and then pilecki is is a person that people go around and say like okay i mean how come i haven't never heard about him well then go back again to the exhibition and learn more because then it makes you get inspired even more um other means of telling his story is our very recent project that was run by one of our uh, of uh, uh, big uh, portals, um, uh, the online uh, reporting multimedia online ex exhibition would say, or like a big reportage uh, on a website, pilecki.onet.pl, which is in three languages, Polish, German, and English, uh, which is a very a um, very interactive way of telling chapters of his story using the materials that we've got uh, that were collected uh, and videos, uh, archival footage and all this. And we also have archival funding findings because the Pilecki story is still not fully closed. And I mentioned the problems with identifying his, uh, his, his remains, but also uh, we were pretty successful very recently to to identify the um, the baptism certificate of Vitol Pilecki, which was which is the very important document that actually confirms uh, clearly the date of his birth, which was not hundred percent sure uh, for quite a time. Uh, so this is this is one way, this covering his story and simply informing people, letting them getting inspired, and there is another way. Uh, more unconventional, I would say, which is which I would call inspiring good practices or inspiring some sort of self-development or maybe providing reason to act. Jack mentioned that. Act, acting. He was successful because he tried to, to poke people to act, to the allies to, re to react to what was happening in Auschwitz. There was no reaction, but but Pilecki gives us reasons to act. And for that, we have various activities and I don't want to um, dwell on them too much. I believe that in, we, we're going to have an interesting conversation later. So let me just tell you one of those activities and perhaps uh, we'll come back to others later. The Vitor Pilecki International Book Award. Something we established Two weeks ago, we, uh, we uh, as the Institute, we have invited uh, submissions to this project. Uh, book award after named after Witold Pilecki, not because he was a famous writer or a great author, but he, he wrote his reports and he wrote those reports in many different ways. Jack mentioned two ways, one by memorizing reports and sending them uh, through people uh, out from Auschwitz and the ones that he wrote uh, after he left Auschwitz. He is the man who inspires to act and he is the man who brought together 
his own experience and not only stated facts, but he also tried to explain them and reflect upon the evil that he witnessed in Auschwitz. And by creating this book award, we want to bring attention on one hand to the fascinating and very difficult history of two totalitarianisms in Central Europe. But on the other hand, we want to point to Vitor Pilecki again as this inspirational figure. I could talk more, but it's time left for that later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, what an inspiration both of you are. Director Kowalski, you've really added to the, uh, the information for this evening and the discussion. So let's bring uh, Jack back to the stage. And um, I'm going to start with the more general uh, questions and then come back to the uh, personal about uh, Vitolt himself. So um, Jack, um, let's start with you as we haven't heard your voice for a little while. And uh, the questions are really around the, the reports coming in. And um, and the reactions. So, how how why do you think the Allied countries ignored the report and took no action? That's that's a really good question, and it was one I really felt I needed to explore in the book. This is as much about the the gathering of reports by Paletsky as it is the failure of the Allies to heed them. So I was able to track down. Um, allied responses to many of the key reports that Paletsky sent. Uh, that first one that I described in the talk in which Paletsky was calling on the allies to bomb Auschwitz, um, you know, there's a, a reason for why Portal said no. Um, it was the height of the blitz at that stage. Britain stood alone and the mission to Auschwitz would have been um, the longest ever undertaken by the RAF. RAF planes at that stage didn't have radar, so they had to be guided by, um, by full moons and lack of clouds if they were to see their targets. In short, a really incredibly difficult mission. And Portal said this would only have symbolic value if we were to try and bomb Auschwitz. And that really struck me because of course, having a symbolic value was in many ways exactly what was needed at that stage in the war. Um, had the Allies attempted to bomb Auschwitz, then it would have created a precedent, which was that when further reports of Nazi atrocities reached the Allies, there would be an impetus towards taking action. And by discounting Paletsky's call for being too difficult and only symbolic, um, the Allies were in fact creating a, a dangerous precedent that meant they were not to intervene uh, in the name of stopping atrocities um, throughout the war. And of course, a couple of years later, when the Americans had joined and there were fighter bombers with radar um, capable of reaching the camp and, and bombing it successfully, um, they turned back to that earlier argument of the British and said oh, it's only of symbolic value. So what started as a sort of plausible excuse in 1940 became, to my mind, uh, quite unconscionable um, by the later stages of the war. And I write about that in the book. There's other factors at play here. Uh, you know, Anti-Semitism, anti-Polonism, you know, a desire to um, only stick to winning the war, you know, which is also has its, can be understandable too. Um, I write about those in the book, but I think, um, you know, what we come away with is of course, uh, not only the Allies' failure to act, but of course, uh, Paleski's just remarkable persistence um, in the face of so much silence, continuing to report and gather evidence. Thank you. I, I think, um, I'm sure there was even more when you think of committees around a table, it must be the same at whatever level and the military and um, we still see it today. Um, I wanted to uh, 
um, mentioned that Anthony Polonsky is in the audience and um, always really good to have uh, Anthony's voice. And um, it, it, there, there may not be anything to add, but he asked if uh, you could say something about the discussion in British military circles about whether Auschwitz should be bombed. Uh, you've more or less answered it, but I just wondered if there was anything else you wanted to draw out. Well, well, I think it, it's to dwell on, you know, how significant is Palecki's contribution to that debate and, and lar largely unheralded um, until now. Much of the debate about whether or not to bomb the camp centers um, around uh, 1944 when uh, two Slovak Jewish prisoners escaped Auschwitz with a report that finally seemed to cut through to the allies and led to a discussion at the highest levels of government again about whether to bomb Auschwitz. And again, they said, no, um, this was in the summer of 1944 at the very um, end of the Holocaust. And I think what's so tantalizing about Paletsky's story, um, one of the great might have beens is when we set the clock back to 1940 and, and realized that there were pleas to the allies even then to stop what was happening in Auschwitz. So, um, you know, there is that special significance to that story. And uh, hearty greetings to Anthony, who, um, you know, read bits of the book and has been um, uh, such an incredible scholar around um, all Polish issues. Absolutely. And just to, to personalize it slightly as well, um, to both of you, um, whether you think the Allies sh should and could have bombed Auschwitz, and if you don't want to answer that, it's fine, but if you do have a, uh, an addition you want to make uh, today, then this is the opportunity. If, uh, just, Borczyk? if I may ask, add a little bit to that. Um, it's, sure. well, we already know, and that was the one way to, uh, to see it, that is whether we have technical uh, abilities to uh, to bomb Auschwitz and uh, for that reason that was possible and it could have been done um, and there are no doubts about it especially towards the end of the war I remember once Jack explaining to me that even in 1940 there were some type of bomber a British bomber could actually reach uh, uh, Auschwitz and return fairly safely so it was theoretically possible also in 1940, 1944, 45, it was absolutely uh, no problem at all. Um, should they have bombed it? I guess they should most probably bomb basically the railroads there around and um, to, uh, to um, well, to impede the transports that come coming into, uh, into the camp. Um, and I believe that that's always a big question about military activities and to what extent you want to win a war on the level of because let's face it in 1944 after successful landing in Normandy the war is over I mean it was clear that the war is gonna end uh, by uh, by the defeat of Germany and deciding whether you want to send uh, send um, planes to um, to carpet bomb uh, other German cities, or you want to use them to to attack uh, the concentration camp, is a decision you can make, and I believe that's that's something we have to keep in mind. Thank you. I would just add to that, Judy, that you know, in 1944, there were still Jewish families boarding trains to Auschwitz, not knowing what fate awaited them, and you know, it's it's you know, would have been one of the most important contributions to um, stopping that happening would have been to bomb the camp in 1940 and place it on the map. Um, you know, it's true that if you were to bomb railroads, they could get rebuilt. And of course, if you destroyed Auschwitz, other camps might have, might have arisen, but you would have put Auschwitz on the map and prevented some at least from getting onto trains um, without knowing where they were going. Thank you. Okay, so let's turn back to Vitor Poletsky himself and um, as a man. Uh, quite a few questions about, about him and his character because of course it's fascinating to for us here when, when especially with Volchik asking us to look at ourselves and what we should be doing. 
So perhaps you could say a little bit about his um, his background and and whether it was his background and his family, his religion that gave him that ability to trust and to have such courage. Um, and perhaps a little bit more about his family. Um, Jack, do you want to go first and then we'll check you and Dim? Um, well, I, you know, one of the greatest uh, moments of the research was getting to know Paletsky's family, but Andre and both his and his sister Zofia. And, you know, I think I got then my first real insights into what an extraordinary chap their dad was, was through their generosity and compassion and, um, and you know, the, the, the stories that they remembered from their childhood in Eastern Poland in a uh, which is now uh, Belarus and you know for me um, you know some of those stories certainly burnished uh, the sort of the, the legend of Vitold but others were ones which as a dad of young kids also <laughs> made me really empathize with him you know sort of failed parenting attempts the well-meaning parenting attempts that <laughs> often went awry and you know I think they helped me gather a sense of this of this extraordinary figure um, extraordinary in some ways because his life in eastern Poland as a gentleman farmer um, as a um, social activist in his community um, was in many ways you know whilst uh, sort of laudatory it was not exceptional. He belonged to a, a sort of class of lesser nobility who were expected to take care of, of their communities. And he did, he did a good job of that. He, uh, he was a man of piety and honesty. But I think what's so striking about him is that but for the events of World War II, he probably would have lived out his days without ever touching uh, world events without coming to our, to global significance. And I think that question is of how he um, did so much that was extraordinary um, from this seemingly ordinary beginning is one that um, really challenges us in our normal everyday lives. You know, what would happen if that extraordinary moment came, how would we respond? And I think um, that's only what sort of inspired me to try and answer that question um, for Vitold was, um, was to see those steps, those decisions in that precise moment they were taking place um, to reflect on my actions and to share his inspirational example. Um, Wojciech, I know you'll have some more context on be told thank you well i just yeah, i just want to add one uh, uh one story that i'm sure you know it just uh, as one of the uh, examples of his of his religious affection or or piety we know that uh, one of the very few things that he left for his family just before execution uh, was the the book the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis, so an author of the from the 15th century uh, pious book that basically teaches its readers how to follow into the steps of Jesus in terms of piety, humility, uh, faithfulness, loyalty, and we can continue fighting the sin. So he was. He used that book. We know that uh, in the um, in the communist prison, and that was something that gave him a lot of comfort. And his children also remember him as a person of faith. So um, I can hardly imagine that this part of his um, of his worldview, of his uh, deepest principles, uh, were, did not play a role in his in in the choices that he has made. Thank you. And then when we look at the, the, the sad end, um, a, a few questions about um, uh, if we could talk a little bit more about his end and uh, also, um, Jack, how you found out where the execution took place. Um, 
Sure. I actually just like to add one, maybe just one more comment to um, Wojciech sure. on, um, on, uh, on his background and I think what's, um, and his faith. I mean, I think um, whilst um, he writes very briefly about that faith um, and is attested to by his, his family um, that he was, you know, a man of, of you know, deep uh, religion, uh, what was also really striking in talking to those who knew him was the fact that he was also a man who kept his faith private. I mean, he wasn't someone to uh, seek to evangelize or push his views on others. Um, in fact, quite a few prisoners in the camp, when they met the, the famous underground leader, were always uh, sort of taken back and said, "Oh, is that he's the leader. He's so unassuming and sort of quiet." You know, he was, you know, a man who um, had a, a very strong, gentle side, which um, certainly um, is attested to in in both his some of his lovely poems he wrote about his um, village and also some of his paintings. He was an art school sort of dropout, as it were, um, and he did some, um, you know, and a painter. So, you know, I think that speaks to me um, of a man who um, was sort of open to the views of others. And, you know, in pre-war Poland, it's a time of, of turmoil in the aftermath of the Great Depression with the rise of nationalisms all around Poland. It was a time of disagreement and a time of radicalism um, in Polecki's village, there have been, um, in, in the local town of Lida, there have been um, some protests against uh, Jewish members in, of the town. There have been, um, before the war, there was quite a few shuttered shops in Lida, we discovered in, in the town records of uh, Jewish families that had, had left. Um, you know, there were also attacks against uh, Polish residents by sort of rising um, rising yeah, Ukrainian and Belarusian uh, national sentiment. The point being that this was a time of discord. And what's really striking about Polecki, um, both before the war and in the very first few months after the German occupation, is that he immediately realizes that the only way to defeat the Germans is by everyone coming together. And he actually had a number of showdowns with um, leaders within the underground um, relating to what he saw as their narrow, nationalistic, and in some cases, anti-Semitic uh, views of what Poland was and who should be in the underground. He had a really simple message that was powerful which was that anyone who wanted to fight against the Nazis, anyone who was prepared to, uh, you know, sort of embrace Poland um, was on his side. And, you know, that's a really powerful message for us today. Like, can we open ourselves up to all points of view for some greater good? Sorry, I think I went off on one there. Back no, to I think I, it's um, fascinating because the the, the... The next question, I'll, I'll direct this to Borshek first, is uh, obviously the, the message is so important and the message both about him and what he did, but also for us in these times. So how do we avoid him becoming some kind of saint or uh, politicizing him in some way when you're promoting his memory? Now, in a way you, can, you could kind of not answer that sensibly, but I guess the, deep underneath it, 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 it it's, it's relevant to all these type of memorials that we we um, we get involved in. Or check. Uh, thank you for this question. Mm, I think one thing is uh, to uh, to look at the person and examine the uh, the source material, the evidence we have, the, the witnesses we can hear uh, in a in a fair way and check. Jack just did it. So nobody came to him and said, make him a saint, or nobody came to him and said, we have to politicize Vitor Pilecki. So try to 
paint him from this angle, not from the other one. So I think just fair scholarship is is the way to to keep uh, Vito Pilecki in his in his place as he was, because all of us are. Uh, we all have our flaws. We all have our uh, well, challenges that we what, that we face. And Pilecki uh, obviously was like like we are. So uh, so that's that's the one thing. The other thing is that we should not shun from appreciating people who did great things. I mean, we that's it happens in every generation. There are people who. Uh, who do things that uh, that change our perspective, that help us out to understand who we are, or perhaps help us to go through the difficult times that we are in, or at least there are some uh, well beacons ahead that we can uh, we can look up to. So um, I think on one hand, let's stay uh, sober and critical to what we know about him, but. Let's try not to, at the same time, uh, to, uh, well, to belittle his achievements just for the sake of being critical. Very good answer. Thank you. I, I'd like to add um, one, I'd like to add yes. one thing there, Judy, which is, you know, something that I like to tell a lot of British and, and American audiences, um, you know, which is that you know, for us, uh, for many at least, World War II ended in 1945 with victory parades and um, sort of job done. Um, that wasn't the experience of Poland or of East, much of Eastern Central Europe. Um, in fact, they were about to have 40 years of totalitarian dictatorship um, in which the memories of people like we told uh, Polecki um, could not be observed. So I sometimes say to you know American or British audiences, I mean, imagine what it would be like if the heroes of D-Day uh, were labeled as uh, traitors to the country and you were forbidden from mentioning their names for two generations. Um, it's extraordinary to think about. Countries like France and Holland and, um, and Denmark have had years to not just commemorate their heroes of World War II, but also to recognize some of those who were not heroes, the darker side of, of their collaboration with the Nazis. And, you know, the two sort of go hand in hand, I think for any country, it's hard to sort of only see the negative side. Um, and having heroes like Paletsky allow you to allow societies to face up to some of the harsh truths. And it's really striking in researching in Poland. I mean, I must have met a dozen families whom um, I was telling them their families' stories because they didn't know them, because their grandparents, their parents had never spoken about what they had done for the underground because it was too dangerous to do it in the communist period. And, you know, Poland and much of Central and Eastern Europe has got decades of rediscovering their past. And that's why, you know, the work of the Pletsky Institute is so great in helping discover these, these untold stories. So I think, you know, it's easy enough to sort of try, you know, for some uh, in the West to sort of scoff at the idea of hero, you know, Polish heroes and isn't it sort of somehow, I don't know, there's, there's some, you know, some sort of racism involved in that. And I would just say that, you know, in Britain, we've had plenty of time to uh, celebrate our heroes. And it's still only now that we're starting to question some of Winston Churchill's legacy after after so many decades and even that's controversial so I, I think you know let's um, you know we we need heroes we need villains I tried to present both in in the book and you know I think that's the aim of historians of storytellers of, of writers is to uh, capture the past and tell these stories and I, I know there will be so many more to emerge from from Polish history that will tell of this dark time. I think that's um, a very fitting um, 
last comment, although I will give you each a, a, a minute to end. I apologise to those of you whose questions I haven't had time to get to. Uh, it's been a very full evening. I do want to finish with a, a comment, although we can't get to the question from um, Michael, who says, thank you for this evening's event. A big thank you to Jack and Vorchek. The book's amazing. He purchased it after seeing a recommendation by His Excellency Am Ambassador Rodchek on Facebook. And it's a wonderful that the story has been shared around the world. Um, so I can only can concur with that. Um, Vitor Piletsky is totally inspirational and uh, that doesn't mean he ha doesn't have clay feet. All our heroes have clay feet and are human and we don't want them to be perfect, uh, nor they shouldn't be. Um, but you have brought his story to life in such a, an a inspirational way. And the two of you have brought to, it to us this evening in, with your own take, you are both inspirational as well, and we will be able to take that forward. So um, thank you to both of you. Thank you to the Polish emb embassy um, for bringing this event to JW3. We, um, we love working with you, uh, your great partners. Uh, thank you, His Excellency um, Ambassador Rojetsky. We were really grateful that you were able to join us this evening as well. And uh, the conversation is important and we will continue to take the conversation forward. And um, there's information um, as, on the websites and um, we'll hear more about the book award as we go forward. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for being here. You've been a, a wonderful audience and those were really um, great questions. So uh, stay safe, everyone, and uh, take care wherever you are in the world. Have a great uh, rest of day and, uh, and a good evening. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Vorchek, and uh, thank you all. Good night. Thank you.